Um, so welcome to day one of the DFTB Plus um, sessions up in Daresbury. Um, and great thanks to our supporting uh, funders for this event. So you know, kind support of PsyK, CCAM, and also the CCP9 network in the UK, uh, without whom this wouldn't happen. So yeah, thank you very much to them. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the connection from DFT into DFTB and a little bit about some of the things that DFTB Plus uh, is about. Okay, hopefully this works. And I just press page down and nothing's happened, so one second. Okay, I'm hoping I don't have to click something. Okay, right, so this kind of figure is sort of ubiquitous in terms of, you see this a lot at particularly material science meetings, in terms of there being a hierarchy of different methods. And so where we're sitting is not quite at the bottom of the tree, but we are somewhere in the, uh, the medium uh, range of quantum mechanical systems up towards the larger end of things, where you've got a description of systems that involve something approximating the Schrodinger equation. Uh, and then below that, of course, we've got first principles methods and ab initio methods um, of various flavors. Uh, and then above us, we get into classical techniques. So this tends to be things like force fields, but then kind of climbing the scale upwards, we have um, continuum methods and eventually things like thermodynamic techniques. So in terms of the, the envelope the DFTB lives, and there's several other things in this kind of box, and we're going to be hearing a little bit about this later in the week. Um, these kinds of methods are designed for dealing with systems on the scale of nanometers, typically. So length scales, you know, perhaps tens of nanometers are accessible, and time scales depends on exactly what you're doing, but around the order of uh, a few picoseconds, maybe a few hundred picoseconds, much longer than that, and you start to be in, in trouble unless you've got a lot of computing resources. So that, that's kind of our box. Um, so in terms of um, where we're coming from, well, the back history of this is um, ubiquitous in um, certainly condensed matter in, in these kinds of areas. If you're a quantum chemist, if you're into things like transition metals, pretty much, uh, again, ubiquitous is density functional theory. So the back history for this goes back pretty much before the Schrodinger equation, actually. Thomas and Fermi are, are around about the, the, the year before sort of the famous Schrodinger paper. Um, so they suggested that you should be able to make statistical models of the way that electrons behave in systems and get something useful out of this. And there's a whole post history on that. Thomas Fermi theory is still around. Uh, you know, if you're an astrophysicist, the equations of state for white dwarfs are actually relativistic Thomas Fermi theory. So they, they quite like using this stuff even today. Um, so you derive the one form of uh, some of the limits on that kind of thing. Um, and it's developed into eventually what's called orbital free density functional theories. So at that point, there's, there's a bunch of papers on the way through. But the issue with the, the Thomas Fermi ideas is that they were a nice idea, but they weren't really a proof that you could actually have that kind of theory and have it make physical sense. So quantum chemistry, um, obviously, this is about the same year that Hartree and Hartree had their first paper. Uh, and then Hartree, uh, uh, Hartree Fock theory is kind of the 30s, um, comes in and people were, were working these sorts of things. But the situation about theories like this, where you use the total charge density uh, to have a look at what's going on in the system, changed radically in the 1960s. So Walter Cohn and co-workers had a pair of papers which essentially set all this on a formally exact basis. So the Homburg Cohn proof, which is uh, 64, formally proves that the charge density encodes everything about the system. Unfortunately, and this is the annoying part, the many body physics in this thing is um, related to uh, a term in that equation that we still don't know the exact answer to. Um, and we've got now 60 something, well, 60 years of attempts to approximate that term. Um, so that was the main point of the 65 paper by, by Walter Cohn. And if I'm honest about it, it's probably the large reason why he got the Nobel Prize in 1998, because the first practical schemes to apply this are the cone charm, where you write down a set of fictitious single particle equations, which give you your charge density, which tells you everything about the system. And if you work with, uh, with those, then what you're going to get is something which calculates, in principle, exact results if you can approximate the exchange correlation term. Now, that area kind of took off with the first um, particularly popular and, and accurate enough that a lot of people used when the original Cohn-Sharm paper actually did work functions of metals pretty well, 
But the first sort of popular uh, entry in this, this space goes back to Perdue and Zunga. So in the early 1980s, the original Perdue Zunga paper was about two different topics, one of them self-interaction, which if you're interested in Leon is, a, is an expert in this area, um, outside of the context of DFTB. The other thing that they gave was a proper parameterization of this missing term. Now, this is only an approximate version, and there are another 40 years worth of literature that incrementally improved this thing, usually by uh, one or two strategies. One is trying to build physics into it. Uh, the other one is to take a large database of high-level calculations and try and find the values of parameters from this. And that area is kind of developing, and it's still going, and people are still publishing new papers in this area. So John Perdue, for example, uh, the scan functionals, which he's published in the last five to 10 years, uh, seem to be extremely accurate. Um, but that area is still, is still developing. Now, this skips over a whole bunch of other developments. So things like generalization of the Kohn-Sharm ideas to finite temperatures. So Mermin in the, the 1970s. Uh, and also um, Grunger and Gross's generalization to time-dependent theories. Again, this kind of becomes relevant a bit later in the week when we talk about time-dependent methods. Because the point about density functional theory, at least in the original flavor, is it's a ground state theory. And so as a result, a bunch of stuff that you'd like to be able to calculate is not really that obviously accessible. It turns out if you look at the time evolution of a system, effectively you Fourier transform that, you get frequency dependence, that tells you about excitations. But there's a bunch of other methods around that. Okay, so that's, that's DFT without the equations. And as I say, there's a lot more history in this. There's a bunch of very nice review articles in these, these kinds of areas. Okay, um, I should also mention that uh, the cohen sharm proof is not the final word in this area. There's some interesting theoretical work in the early 80s um, and later, which, which shows various subtleties and intricacies and generalizations of these kinds of ideas. Okay, right, so that's DFT. Right, we're gonna talk about semi-empirical method for this week. So um, I think other than possibly one or two numbers from DFT, sneaking into people's slides. Most of the time we're going to be um, talking about um, various different methods which are derived from or related to um, information about the system. So you can have fully empirical methods which are completely based on um, almost phenomenological ideas of taking data and fitting these kinds of things. Um, and then you can have things that, that dial that down and head towards more first principles techniques. So in terms of why you do this, well, the point is that they're fast. They tend to be quite low cost methods compared to first principles, ab initio kinds of techniques. And usually the, the physical model underneath all of this thing is relatively straightforward to understand. So sometimes you get something that maps onto the intuitive kind of picture that people like thinking about in, in for example, chemistry. So sometimes doing it this way actually helps you to understand your system a bit better. Um, and Often these things are quantum mechanical, which is one of the things that a lot of the, the, the methods on the higher scales, the force fields, tend to have a lot of problems with. So processes where you get something which is intrinsically quantum mechanically non-local, and so that can be bond making breaking, that can be exotic stuff that some areas of condensed matter are interested in. Um, but in those cases, force fields can, st can struggle quite a bit with this. But these methods tend to have this built in. And it's easily extensible, which is also kind of nice. So if you can do something with a first principles method, after a bit of thought, you can usually find a way to do this with a semi-empirical technique. And if you're lucky, you can get most of the results and uh, things that you'd want to calculate. Hopefully at about perhaps 100 to 1,000 times faster. Okay, right. Um, so type binding is a general family of methods. And essentially, it just boils down to the idea that the electronic states that you're dealing with in your quantum mechanical method are associated with functions on atoms. So the resulting combinations of these things can spread out over the whole system, but it's built up of a basis of functions which are local to each of the atoms in the system. And, and that's where the name comes from. Um, and so the resulting Hamiltonian could be first principles, it could be empirical, it could be somewhere in, that, in between these kinds of things. And so most people, when they hear the word type binding, if they've been around the field for a bit, tend to think of what's called empirical type binding which is um, essentially fit these things against a big database of experimental numbers. Um, but that's not quite where we are. Okay, right. So in terms of different types, well, I've already mentioned this, you have the empirical end of things, which is fit a bunch of parameters from typically experimental measurements, but sometimes from other principal uh, theories, so whether it's DFT or something else. 
Um, then semi-empirical, which is where we're living for this week, is trying to value it as much as possible on the basis of first principles and typically store these things. So fit a few parameters that are missing, but otherwise try and rely on something as close as possible to first principles, but approximated down and typically recycled by storing things and interpolating things. And then there's, of course, ab initio type binding, where you're using functions which are localized on atoms. Um, and there are a bunch of DFT codes and also a bunch of both Hartree-Fock and post hartree codes in this category, where you're using an atom-like uh, atom basis. Now, sometimes people don't think about it in those kinds of terms, but it is a set of functions that associate with the atom. It's not the only choice in that field. You know, plane waves, grids, dot, 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 wavelets, whatever you want to choose, can all do this sort of thing. But OK, um, in that case, there's no free parameters whatsoever. But we're in the middle box. We try and minimize the number of free parameters that are uh, adjustable, but we still do have some stuff in there. OK, so the prehistory for DFTB goes back to, again, the 1920s. So the linear combination atomic orbital idea it dates back to, to that kind of era. And then we have the big paper in the field for type binding, which is the Slater and Costa one from, again, the 1950s. So the idea here is you've got some clever geometrical transformations, which can simplify your calculation by doing things in a preferred reference frame. And so what you can do is tabulate things in terms of what looks like bonding interactions between atoms. So sigma bonds, pi bonds, delta bonds, and so on. And that makes life a lot more straightforward. It does carry uh, a restriction, though, that this is then a two-center transformation. So you've got a two-center Hamiltonian. So then we've got the cone uh, work from the 60s. Um, and then the idea is about total energies, because you can fit band structures in type binding. But if you want a total energy, you need terms that in DFT would be called double counting. But in the type binding world, they tend to get thought of as repulsive terms. And Jim Chaddy pointed out how to do that in the 1970s the pairwise repulsive term. This is why people talk about repulsive in this com uh, community, because this thing uh, should, at least in, in very straightforward type bindings, always be a monotonically decreasing function, which pushes things apart. And we'll hear more about this one on Friday, I think. Um, so Yola is nodding in the audience there, uh, in terms of um, these, these kinds of um, repulsive pairwise interactions. And then, and this actually happened a little bit after people already started theories in this kind of area, there's a formal connection to DFT. So Fuchs and Haydock proved that actually methods like what's called non-self-consistent DFTB, that in two seconds, um, are actually input-only density functionals with some approximations on top of them. OK, right. OK, so the specific flavor that we're mostly talking about this week, DFTB, uh, goes back to Helmut Eschrig and Gotthard Seifert uh, in um, Chemnitz uh, at the time. Um, and in the early 1980s, well, mid 1980s, they published kind of the first paper in this space, which gives the, the basic ideas about how to approximate something that looks like a linear combination atomic orbital DFT method with something that looks like type binding. And um, so that was kind of the, the original version of this. And I say the Fuchs Haydock paper is talking about exactly that kind of, kind of type binding. Um, then wind forward to the, the late 1990s. And we meet two new characters, Thomas Fraunheim, who is Balint of my former bosses. Well, Balint's current boss, I think he's, he's an emeritus professor now. Um, and we will uh, meet the, the contributions for that, but also Marcus Elsner, um, who's um, PhD and then subsequent work on this. And he's been a major popularizer of this method in these kinds of areas, um, is to use self-consistency in these kinds of equations. So the main applications that Marcus has been interested in are biochemical systems. So organic into, into biosystems where charge transfer matters. And he's continued the DFTB second order expansions into what's called DFTB3. And again, we'll see some of that on the way past over the week. OK, right. So, um, so in terms of DFTB versus DFT, well, the idea is that we've got something which is fast. So it's about 100 to 1,000 times faster for most typical systems. And if you can use DFT in some area, you can typically parameterize something like this in DFTB. Um, it's a fairly simple representation. And if you are very careful with your parameterization, and machine learning is starting to be perhaps one of the potential solutions in some of this area, but there are other ingenious ways to deal with this as well, you can get within what's called chemical accuracy. So anyone in the audience not from a chemical background, chemical accuracy, one kilocalorie per mole is the standard unit, which is a rather weird unit choice, but 
it is thermal energy at room temperature, which means you can calculate barrier, reaction barriers at room temperature if you're that accurate and, and get a reasonable chance on getting, uh, getting the right answer. The disadvantages are the worst scaling parts of the method when you're actually applying this in calculations are based around the linear algebra that goes into solving the problems. And modern DFTs typically have the same bottleneck once you get to very big systems. Problem for DFTB, and we'll hear about one of the alternatives for this, which doesn't actually have this problem, is that we have a pairwise parameterization. And so you have to make um, something which is proportional to the square of the number of chemical species in your system when you're building new parameters. And the reason for that is due to the repulsive stuff, and I'll, I'll briefly mention in a minute, but more on that later in the week. Um, and then there isn't really a systematic way to improve the minimal basis approximations in this. So there are some ideas and there's a few papers out there, but, but there's nothing sort of universe, universal yet for this. Okay, right. Okay, right, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, so basic ideas about DFTB are to calculate interactions using density functional theory and try and store the things. So you get basis functions, which are atomically centered um, things and they're in a crystal-like or a condensed phase, so large molecule environment. So they're squashed by confining potential. We'll talk about that on Friday. Um, and we get a non-orthogonal set of functions. So you get on-site free energy from atoms, which takes into account the dissociation limits for these things. And we have a two-center approximation. And there's actually a reason for, for this one, and it goes back to the, uh, the, uh, the Seifert-Eschrig paper, where they point out there's some error cancellation. In fact, we actually got out expanded a bit more in some later papers that he wrote. Uh, and it turns out that three and four center terms that you get in DFT nearly cancel each other. So there are some good reasons based around things like pseudo potential ideas to remove them from the theory. So that actually means that we are, we are technically a two center approximation, even though things like the self-consistency are a little bit strange in that, that context. Um, and we get a total energy from a sum of the resulting electronic band energies. And also for DFTB, the problem with parameterization is the repulsive term. And again, we'll, we'll meet this later in the week. So the idea with this is that in DFTB, we have um, a total energy expression, which is essentially fitted against the difference between the electronic parts of the um, DFTB um, bound structures and a total energy from DFT. And so you, you tabulate this thing up. And I'm not sure if my mouse is coming up particularly. Uh, and you actually store the thing. And historically, this needed quite a bit of expertise to get right. Now, the problem with this one is that it is a pairwise term. So if you want to fit, say, a hydrocarbon system, uh, you'll have to do essentially pairwise combinations for these things. And if you think about it for a little bit, that scales as the square of the number of combinations inside of this thing. Now, it turns out the carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, carbon combination is symmetric and they're, they're equivalent to each other, uh, which cuts things down a tiny bit, but you've still got something which is one triangle of a matrix of the different combinations. Um, and that's, that's obviously a little bit of hard work especially if you've got a system with maybe seven or eight different chemical elements. What we'll hear about um, later in the week is the XTB family of methods, which approach this from a different angle. And in that case, they don't actually have this N squared behavior. They have um, something which is linear in the number of combinations. So XTB is parameterized pretty much the whole periodic table up to, um, I think it's ray, uh, radon, isn't it, Sebastian? Or is it, yeah. So element 86 on the table. And as I say, we'll, we'll, we'll hear more about them a bit later on. Okay, right. So why? Ah, right. So in terms of DFTB implementations, well, it's out in a whole bunch of different codes, and this is an incomplete list of some of them. If you go to www.dftb.org, this is a community site for the method generally, and has got a bunch of things like parameterizations, but also we try and keep track of some of the codes that have implemented these equations. Um, and you know, some of you may have used things like Gaussian in the past, and if you dig around a bit, DFTB is one of the methods that they've got built in. Um, so, the specific implementation for the week is, of course, DFTB+, and we're on our own website that, that links off there, so dftbplus.org. We're also on GitHub and various other places, um, and that's what we're going to be looking at and playing around with this week. Okay, so the ancient history for this goes back to a European network where uh, Balint and myself and Simona Sana, who is uh, a professor in... Uh, is he still in Paderborn or has he moved? I think Simona is... is somewhere else in academia, but um, where we were um, in a network to look at rare earth dope nitride materials. And this kicks off 
well, we're coming up on, on the 20 year anniversary now for uh, um, the network and for the DFTV plus code, in fact. Uh, okay, so why on earth rare earths? Well, the idea is um, if you want to do light emitting diodes, current technology for, for high efficiency ones is universally based on, on nitride materials. And those are very, very efficient for, for producing light in the blue end of the spectrum. So solid state lighting now is dominated by these things. They overtook even things like fluorescent tubes around about 10 years ago. The big problem is that they're not very good if you get away from those shorter visible wavelengths um, and the, the efficiency of these things nose dives. And particularly, there's, and this is still not a solved problem really, there's a region in the kind of green where there isn't anything anywhere near that efficient that you can use for solid state lighting. So the idea behind the network here was rare earth emissions will give you nice red, green, and blue for different chemical choices, but they've all got the same chemistry. So if you can crack this recipe for one material, you can just switch in and you get the same technology and just choose your wavelength. You make mixes of these things and you can get CIE chromaticity rendering, which is really good. And it should have worked. And it's still kind of knocking on. People have managed to make red LEDs using this technology, um, but the area is, is really not quite uh, gone where it was. But the upshot on that was we had a bit of a problem from the theory side, because as one of the two theory nodes in that network, um, we had to add a whole bunch of extra things that weren't in the DFTV method at the time. So this is things like F-shell electrons, because these are lanthanide systems, and they're also correlated because uh, they're, they're sufficiently interacting. They're heavy enough that there's spin orbit coupling going on, um, and the system is also technically going to be excited states. So it became quite kind of clear we had to write a new code at that point, and that was that was sort of the nucleus of DFTV plus. Um, and you know, first publication for the code goes back to about 2007, um, but we're still alive and well. And we had a paper now two years ago, um, and. I don't know how well the bolding is coming out, but people in bold are going to be around at the meeting and talking about various different things uh, in terms of applications and, and uh, things that the, the methodology can use. And there's a couple of names, Missy off here, who you're going to meet, well, informally over the week, but they're certainly going to be around on Friday talking about um, next generation parameterization ideas in this area as well. Okay, right. So entirely personal sort of choice on this thing, the sort of exotica that, that um, the FTV Plus can do. Um, is things that are, for example, structures which are not regular periodic solids, so helical geometries, and eventually we're going to generalize that to, to other more exotic cases. But these are cases where you can't make an, a convenient unit cell for the thing. So um, you can do various different things here. The non self consistent version, this is in the code base at the moment, self consistent might be in, a, in a, another release point or so. Um, we've also got things like non-collinear spin and spin orbit, which is a, a fallback to the, the rare earth issue. And that means you can do things like looking for global optimization of spin patterns in systems. So for example, this is, this is, a, is a quick test with um, an algorithm to find global arrangements of spin. Normally when people talk about spin in, in quantum systems, they talk about up and down. Now what they usually don't mention is they're quantizing with respect to the Z direction. So doing a global up and down direction for this thing. It turns out there's a whole zoo of different systems where that stops happening and you either get local direction quantization um, or you get something more relativistic going on. And so even simple things like the ion dimer, you can get different configurations where this thing is with spin orbit. The leftmost one is a regular ferromagnetic thing pointing along the axis. You can get a ferromagnetic thing sideways and you can get an anti-ferromagnetic combination for these kinds of things. And then DFTP is fast enough that given a, uh, about a week of computer time, you can, you can chew your way through different local minima on these things by using some global optimizer for these. Okay, right. Um, we've also got a bunch of excited state technologies. And if someone's tried a method in DFT, there's probably a corresponding version for DFTB. So a bit later in the week, we're going to hear the two main families of techniques for this. Uh, so Franco is somewhere in the audience, maybe. Didn't see him. Okay. Uh, and Thomas Niehaus, who, who you'll, you'll both run into, taking things from different directions. Now, this is actually descended from what I mentioned about the, the uh, Runga Gross ideas about time dependent DFT. This is the DFTB version of this. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of things there. And you know, the history for this goes back uh, even longer than the, the DFTB plus code. So even back around 2000, we were fast enough to do things like Spectra for things like C60. And these days you can do that on a laptop in a few minutes. 
Um, okay, right. I mentioned uh, about time propagation. You can also look at motion of things off the ground state. So you can look at real time propagation of electron densities in molecules, but also periodic geometries. As I say, Franco will talk a bit later about this for the meter. And okay, but this is just some spectra. These days we can we can now do this in, in solvent phase, which you'll hear more about solution from, from Sebastian on I think Wednesday afternoon. So we've got my days right. Um, but um, that allows you to, to, to treat various things. And this is just a comparison of various different techniques for a fairly boring carbonyl molecule. But it turns out that we can actually nearly nail the, the values for something like CASPT2 um, with this sort of technique. OK, right. Um, OK, I'm going the wrong way again. So right direction now. And various things like many body excitations. So um, you might hear some about this uh, in, in Thomas's session later in the week. But things like particle-particle RPA is a good way to get collective behaviors into exotomic systems. OK, right. Uh, correlated systems, which I'm kind of interested in. So things like nickel oxide, which is the famous one in this sort of space. And there's a whole family of methods based around what was originally LDA plus U, but adapted into the FTP. Um, and you can apply this sort of thing to complex oxide systems. So this is, for example, a paper from a couple of years ago, Gotthard Seifert is, is um, one of the co-authors on this thing, looking at iron oxide systems, where what we've got here is a, is a system where we're going above a, a structural phase transition. And then if you look at the density states of these things, you can see that you get something which is qualitatively similar to a couple of different choices from the DFT world, um, but it's fast enough to start looking at multiple minimum alternative structures uh, much more efficiently. Okay, right. Okay. We'll also hear, and this is going to be um, on Wednesday morning, about open boundary transport calculations. So Alex, who's in, in the back of the room there, uh, will be telling you a bit about um, electronic transport through, through systems. So again, this is an idea where um, it's appeared in DFT as well. But the idea is not to find a ground state or an excited state, but instead to do a calculation where you connect the system up to reservoirs. And so what you can do is, is um, for example, uh, steady state equilibrium situations where you've got a difference in chemical potential between two sides of your system and you've got currents flowing. Or you can start to look at transistor geometries and more complicated cases and look at flow through these things. So in that case, you can, you can see various things like, for example, quantization of um, conductivity, uh, but you can actually get access to things like the electrostatic potentials in these sorts of systems. One of the byproducts from this kind of thing, and if I finish the tutorial, it might be knocking around somewhere in the system, is we can also do things like semi-infinite surfaces and the ends of nanowires and nanotubes and things like that, where the thing continues on to infinity using the same technology. Okay, right. Um, the code is also large scale parallel, and we'll, we'll hear a bit more about that um, in terms of uh, some ideas about small scale parallelism on the, the, the cloud system we're going to be using this week. But in principle, DFTB plus scales up on some of the bigger uh, supercomputers on the planet. So, for example, uh, some results from uh, a couple of years ago, which was using the Cori system over in the US, where this is uh, a, a hybrid CPU GPU cluster. And you can scale up to tens of thousands of processors for these kinds of things. Um, OK, right. We've also got GPU acceleration uh, if you've got uh, the hardware. Okay, right. Um, we connect to a bunch of other frameworks. And so um, you know, DFTB Plus is available with the, the Conda packaging system. More about that very soon. Um, and that's going to be what we're going to be using images from for most of the tutorials for the, for the week. It also pops up in a variety of other places, including um, the electric structure library, which um, a couple of the locals from Daresbury have got a strong connection to. Okay, right. Um, so quantum mechanical classical calculations, and there's various ways that mix these things together. We're not going to show too much in this area, but we will show some of the interfacing to, to other codes. So things like IPI and uh, the ARSA code later in the week. 